Ew. It's fragrant. People ask all the time, are there fragrant orchids? And yes, there are a lot of fragrant orchids, but we want to talk about Bobo Film. Bulbophyllum is an amazing genus of orchid and it's perhaps the most underappreciated genus of all of the orchids because Bulbophyllum is the second largest genus of all of the plants on earth. There's over 2,000 species and they exist in all of the world's tropical rainforest regions which means that every single continent has Bulbophyllum on it. It's very strange to think about that when you look at the tropical band and the amount of oceans it has to cross. Bulbophyllum is probably very old. Orchids have been on this planet for something like 80 million years. We have a lot of fossilized evidence, and we're going to show you a little thing here in this video of what is fossilized. But basically, when bugs get the orchid po pollen stuck on them, and then they fly and get stuck in the goo, like you see in Jurassic Park when they're stuck in that stone, some of that stone they get the dinosaur DNA from also had bugs with orchid pollen on their back. So orchids have been around a long time, but what's really driving paleobotanists crazy is that they don't really know a lot about what orchids used to look like, what the plant used to look like, what the flower used to look like. We can kind of guess, and there are some clues, and uh, the people who do the hard science on this have definitely figured some things out. But one of the things that I, as a layman, and my understanding of it, rather suspect is that one of the oldest orchids is probably Bulbophyllum. Bulbophyllum being in all these tropical zones, it's very hard for orchid seedlings to, to drift across that much ocean and settle in another jungle. So I kind of suspect as the continents break apart and start moving across the earth on the slow drift of the tectonic plates, that these Bulbophyllums are going along for the ride since the late Cretaceous. That's just my personal theory I am not a scientist on this, and I'm sure some of you folks that study this, please contribute to the video. If you know something about this, send us a comment. We'd love to hear it. Uh, but that's just kind of how we understand it. There are so many different forms and so many different types of Bulbophyllum. Now, with there being 2,000 plus species of Bulbophyllum on the whole planet, we can't really have them all, all here in the nursery. We have many. We have many dozens of Bulbophyllum, and just from what we have, it's a huge collection of plants. Just from what we have is a very wide variety. And a lot of Bulbophyllum, this one here, uh, it smells terrible. It smells absolutely terrible. And a lot of Bulbophyllum will have a fragrance. And a lot of them, the fragrance is quite strong. And in many cases, the fragrance is awful because a lot of flies and beetles pollinate uh, Bulbophyllum. Now, how do we know this? We have photographic evidence, folks. We have the evidence. And we're going to show you right here in our own nursery. It's a plant that's from the Philippines, but it's got a domestic fly all wrapped up in it. And by the time it's done working its magic, you can see the Bulbophyllum has got the pollen on its back. The one we are talking about that's in the video is this one. It's Bulbophyllum levaniae. This is the actual one in the video. The video with the footage we're showing you with the fly in it is from yesterday. And this is the flower already kind of shriveling up and turning yellow because the pollen cap is broken. Whether it fertilized or, fertilized or not, we don't know. But the flower is now done with that pollen cap breaking. Here's another one. It's a division of the same plant. It's got two spikes on it. If these things all start blooming simultaneously and we keep them next to each other, I guarantee you they will pollinate here in the nursery because the local flies have taken to it. Now, Bulbophyllum being this enormous genus, it comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. This is a relatively large plant. The largest of the Bulbophyllum is probably these Bulbophyllum phalaenopsis that have pseudobulbs like this and leaves that can be four or five feet long. And then you got dainty little things like this one, you know, and this is a Bulbophyllum, oh, I got to cheat here, Pardolatum, right? Tiny little flower, when it blooms, it almost looks more like Restrepia. It doesn't really look a lot like this other Bulbophyllum. Sometimes there's Bulbophyllum that create a little fan of flowers. It's like Syrup tetalum. This is a type of Bulbophyllum that makes a flower that's like that, where the flower is this cluster of blooms. It's just about to open. But there's actually a few different flowers here. Each one of these is a different flower on the same inflorescence. 
And it's definitely one that's going to smell. It's got this red tone to it. It looks like rotting flesh. And the things that eat rotting flesh will actually be attracted to it. They'll look at the color and, the, and they'll smell the smell of uh, putrid, uh, stagnant uh, carrion meat. And um, they'll come in to eat it. Some mobile filum are tiny, tiny. This is very small. You see how small this flower is and the plant. Next to my finger is very small. Please don't look at my nails. I know I need a manicure, but the nursery. So yes, you can see very wonderful plant. Bulbophyllum do excellent inside terrariums. It's the type of thing that if you can keep a intermediate, an intermediate to cool environment and keep it rather consistent, keep them a little bit on the wetter side for the roots, although they do really like a lot of air movement. Sometimes Bulbophyllum will do a thing where they kind of hover, where they'll need about an inch or two of medium because the roots the roots sometimes only grow about an inch or two long. So you only need an inch or two of medium, and then it'll hover above that with a little air pocket between the plant. Come on over this way, I'll show you. While we're on the way, we're going to stop here and look at this Bulbophyllum lobii. This is very characteristic of a lot of Bulbophyllum. It's got this throat with a, a jiggly throat here. And that's so when the bug steps on it wrong, it loses its balance. It gets launched up into the pollen, and it gets stuck. Just like our little friend from the video, the fly, got stuck. And the plant will hold it there until the pollen cap breaks. And then magically, it releases, and the fly is ready to go about on its journey. They love these bubble film. They smell like poop. They smell like rotting meat. They smell like, there's one that smells like rotting shrimp. I know because I used to work in a Japanese restaurant in high school, and we had to peel two, three, four hundred shrimp at a time to make all those tempura shrimp. Uh, somebody got to peel those things, and at the end of the night, you will never forget that smell. And there's a bubble film, kind of takes me back. Come over this way, I'll show you some cool things. With these bubble film being all over the world, they come in all these different shapes and sizes. But really, there's one thing that's common to all of them. It's that the leaf has a big, fat pseudobulb at the bottom. That's what it means. Bulbo, bulbous, film, leaf. It, each leaf on the rhizome's got a big, bulby part. Sometimes they shrivel up, they get a little wrinkly. Some of them like it drier than others. Some of them like it wetter. We're really trying hard to grow all the bulbos as well as we can, but sometimes they come from dramatically different climates. There's also some other weird exceptions in the bulbophyllum film world too. For example, most of the oil bulbophyllum, film, if it's bifoliate, that means that each bulb, typically one bulb has one leaf, right? But if each bulb has two leaves, it's bifoliate. It's a two-leafer. Those are the bulbophyllum from Africa. Africa has all the bifoliate uh, bulbophyllum. As far as I know, there are true experts on this subject because it really is a fascinating orchid. And then come around this side. I'll show you some more on this side. We have them growing on planks. We have them potted up over here. You can see on this side of the nursery, we have them all potted up. They do great in a mix of uh, perlite. Uh, and some sphagnum. They like to have that combination of wet and dry. And if you put them in a basket, you don't need to go all the way up on the basket. You, you can, they can do with a little bit of moss. They don't have to have the full thing of moss. They can do, and if you're going to pot them, pot them wider before you pot them deeper if the plant is getting bigger. And then come on this side. Come over here and I'll show you more. There's some really fascinating ones. They have some interesting, very, very interesting uh, form. So here's one where the bulb of film, the bulb is actually really tiny, right? And then the rhizome is actually quite long and it's got a very thick, rigid leaf on it. So it's almost like a succulent, right? This one's called clandestinum, clandestine. Uh, it's the one that's uh, when you see it in nature, it's actually rather hard to find. These bulb of film come in all shapes and sizes. They come in all shapes and sizes, and some of them are really quite lovely as plants. Uh, very easy to enjoy and if you grow this in a terrarium and you can maintain it has one two three four new growths on this if you grow this in a terrarium and you maintain a good steady environment for it the kind that it likes it'll be in flower just all the time just all the time they're very prolific bloomers when you get them into the ideal environment in a greenhouse like where we are we rather struggle to have them in the perfect environment year-round it's easy to kind of get them in a zone twice a year, once in spring and once in fall. We have a whole bunch over here growing in a basket. Again, you can get these things to get very big, very healthy, 
They make some lovely flowers with bright colors. And, and it's old. This is an ancient plant. And they're still around, and they're still adapting and changing. Bulbophyllum, I think, is probably, if you were to ask the plants of the world, Bulbophyllum is the gold standard for orchids. If you ask the people, we're all going to say that thing we see at the supermarket, because that's the one we see all the time, and that's what we think of when we think of an orchid. But if you ask all the plants what they think of when they think of an orchid, they would probably think of Bulbophyllum. There's so many of them, and who knows how far back they are on the orchid family tree. It's really hard to tell, but I'd be willing to wager that the Bulbophyllum go all the way back to dinosaur times. If you look through the nursery, you'll see we're growing Bulbophyllum many different ways. And if you're growing it at home, you have a lot of options. You don't have to grow it one particular way. Just because we're growing it a certain way doesn't mean that you have to grow it the same way. You can grow it however you want. Just make the proper adjustments. So, for example, look on this side and you'll see some Bulbophyllum growing on mounts and little plastic bits. This one here is just growing on a piece of fir bark. If you need to, you can add a bit of moss to keep a little moisture retention, especially if you notice that maybe it's not doing well with your water frequency. If you're the type of person who waters maybe once or twice a week, you can grow it this way very well. You'll also see on this side we're growing a whole bunch of them very well in pots. You can grow it in a plastic pot. We find the sphagnum mixed with a little bit of perlite gives good drainage and air movement to the roots but also retains a lot of moisture. Bulbophyllum roots like to get real, real wet when you water them. But if you look at where they grow in nature, they tend to grow on branches and they grow a little bit up, a lot of them. They'll grow a little up. They want to have some air movement. They like, they like doing this a lot where they start to crawl out of the pots. They want to have their roots exposed to a good amount of air. But Bulbophyllum roots don't get much longer than this usually. Each rhizome will make roots that are maybe a couple inches long, and then it'll move on and start another rhizome and start making roots there. These back bulbs with the back roots, those roots don't continue to grow. Some orchids, vandas, anything in the vanda family, the roots get longer and longer and longer. That's your phalaenopsis, that's your vandas, all of the, uh, all of the Japanese neophonesias. Those things, they like to have big roots growing forever and getting longer, but bulbophyllum will grow roots, move, stop, grow, move, stop. The roots never get that long. You don't have to go crazy potting deep root medium. Here's one that's about to flower. And if you look at this basket it's growing in, it's really just about two inches of moss that we're using for this basket. The moss also with the basket, it aerates very well because they like to get very wet and have a lot of good air movement. If you are growing bulbophyllum in a terrarium, I highly recommend having a fan or some kind of air circulation in there. It does wonders just to have a light breeze on the plant. In a basket is beautiful in a pot. We also grow them for some of the smaller varieties. We like to put them in a little bit of terracotta. The terracotta will retain moisture, but then also kind of release it back out. It's like a wet dry. It's a very, um, it's a very nice way to kind of have the, 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 the water balance stay even with the terracotta. Because bulbophyllums, they like a real steady sort of humid environment. They come from jungles mostly. It's kind of a jungle orchid. You don't really see them much outside of jungles. Rainforests, places like that. Lots of water in the tropical zones all around the planet and all the different continents. It's a really fascinating plant for that reason. And you can see there's so many different ones. When you're trying to mount a bulbophyllum or pot it, it can be real tricky. Because some bulbophyllums stop, uh, start high on the tree and they come down. This is a really great example. We had this plant growing on this log for a long time like this. And there was another one that was growing from the top down. And we saw the other one growing from the top down was growing twice as fast. So we just put a hole on the other side and we started growing like this. And sure enough, here it is a year later and it's almost tripled in size. So this one likes to grow from the top and go down. Some of them want to go from the bottom and grow up. They really like to grow up. And some like to grow sideways. I don't know which ones are which. There's 2,000 species. It's immense. You can spend a lifetime just studying this type of orchid and still not feel like you know everything about them. They go from Australia. You start heading west. They're all through Indonesia and the Philippines. And when you look at the map in that area of the world, it's just a mess of islands. They're on every one of them. And then they go up into Asia. You can see them going into 
India and they go over into Africa. They are literally all around the world and they even show up in the Americas. Crazy plant, bulbophyllum.